Ms. Nelson is a registered dietitian, New York State Certified Dietitian Nutritionist, and a Certified Diabetes Educator at the Institute of Human Nutrition at Columbia University. Ms. Nelson has been active with the American Diabetes Association, currently serving on the National Board of Directors, and the American Heart Association, previously serving on the Board of Directors of the New York City Affiliate, the Advisory Council, Heart at Work, Nutrition Counseling Workshop Planning Committee, and as a member of the Nutrition Committee. She has also served on the editorial board for RN Magazine. Hi, Maudie. How are you? Hi, Stephanie. I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. So good. today I'd like to ask you some questions about dietary management for a person with diabetes. Well, this is um, one of the most concrete areas in nutritional care that you can come up with. Since diabetes is all about the body either not making enough insulin or making insulin but not using it well, you can pretty well manage to figure out how much carbohydrate you're eating for the amount of insulin that you're either taking or the amount of insulin that your body is still producing. Now carbohydrate, as we know, is anything that's got sugar, whether it's natural sugar like um, uh, the sugar in fruits, the sugar of milk, the lactose, or added sugars like the sugars in um, cakes and, and treats, okay? Mm -hmm. And other forms of carbohydrate are starches. So all the foods that we love so dearly, beans, which is the category of beans, might be the most body-friendly okay. food in the world, and especially for people who have diabetes, type 1 or type 2. Beans are very high in soluble fiber. So carbohydrates means all things with sugars and all things with starches. Beans, rice, bread, corn, potatoes, all the starchy vegetables and so on. And vegetables have a small amount like broccoli, asparagus, right. but it's almost, I wouldn't say trivial, but it's, it's very much in the background. The main carbohydrates are starchy vegetables, grains, breads, pasta, and fruits. Now, um, when a person is diagnosed with diabetes, as one of their care providers, my goal is to focus on preventing long-term complications, which have to do with damage to blood vessels. So we're also going to keep in mind that their blood pressure should be as close to normal as possible. We also want to keep in mind that their cholesterol level should be as close to normal as possible, and I'll come back to how those um, two conditions can be influenced by diet, okay. by food choices. So preventing long-term complications. We also want to ensure good nutritional well-being. So in case someone is very worried about eating some foods and their diet has become very skewed, we want to be sure that the diet is at least as well-rounded and has as much variety as possible. And the number one thing right off the bat is we want to make sure the blood sugars stay in as close to normal range as possible. So step one is managing carbohydrates. How much carbohydrate a person should eat shouldn't be spoken of in terms of per day, but really per meal. Because the goal is to see what is your blood sugar before the meal, how much carbohydrate you can eat, and where is your blood sugar two hours later. Mm -hmm. And for many people with type 2 diabetes, if they aim for 60 grams of carbohydrate at one meal, they're usually going to get pretty good blood sugar patterns. And sometimes you can up it to 70 or 80 or 90. You know, it's very individual. Yeah. For someone with type 1 diabetes who's producing no or essentially no insulin, they actually will be able to establish a ratio of how much insulin they take for the amount of carbohydrate they'll eat. So putting that in people speak, <laughs> you can generally say, here's my syringe or here's my pump, I will give myself this many units of insulin for this much carbohydrate. And it's very easy to find that match. And then when you do that, you, you pretty much have a fairly open season on almost anything you really want to eat, as long as you are matching your insulin to the carbohydrate you're eating. People who have type 2 diabetes can do that in a sort of more um, general way because they might be taking a, an oral agent, a pill, to help make more insulin, or they might be taking a pill to improve their body's sensitivity to their insulin, or other categories of ways to 
bring the blood sugar patterns as close to normal as possible. So let's say you get the blood sugar right by eating a carbohydrate amount that's good. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it doesn't mean no sugar, Okay. honestly. <laughs> um, almost anyone with diabetes who I say, it's all right to have white or brown sugar, they think I'm, I'm just a landed from Mars. Yeah. Because we gotta, you know that someone's hopefully going to get this down and do it for the rest of their lives, which is easily another 50 or 60 years, give or take. And you don't want it to be so rigid or so exclusive that someone will have so many occasions to say, eh, yeah. I can't do that. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. So you bring it to as close to reality as you can. Okay. So the carbohydrate is the first, um, what we would call in nutrition, nutrient that you're going to manage. Then let's look at cholesterol because you want to make sure your blood cholesterol level is within the target range. Believe it or not, the foods that affect your blood cholesterol level are mainly fats. Most people think that's it on the eggs or that's it on the shellfish. Well, truthfully, the eggs, the cholesterol that's in eggs and shellfish and chicken and pork and beef and lamb makes um, has an effect but it's really almost unimportant compared to the effect of the amount of fat and the kind of fat you eat. So all the guidelines say reduce your saturated fat as much as possible. And I'll give you a clue. Saturated fat marches across your plate on four feet, okay, <laughs> most of the time. So the fat of pork, the fat of beef, the fat of lamb, the fat of who else is on four feet that you might eat? Okay. So the guys in the, the livestock out in the yard, yeah. those are not 100%. The fat on those, uh, in that, on those steaks or chops is not 100% saturated, but it's kind of high. Like yeah. somewhere around 60 to 50, maybe as little as 40 for pork. Okay. <clears throat> but when you're trying to kind of push as much of your saturated fat off of the plate as possible, keep in mind the main sources, and it's going to be the four-legged guys. Chris. And the fat of milk which would mean the fat of cheese. And again, the message is not stop eating red meat and stop eating cheese, but <clears throat> think about where your, what your meal is. And you wouldn't want to have the cheese and the red meat at the same time because that's a lot of saturated fat right. in one meal. Okay. One thing that I could see being really difficult is what about when, when <coughs> you're going out to a restaurant and you don't know exactly what's in your food and whether there's hidden saturated fats? That's a good point. In restaurant meals, there are always kind of a lot of mystery. Um, delicious? Yes. Delicious mysteries. So you can start by just doing a little homework and finding out, like, if it's a restaurant that specializes in seafood or steaks or um, if it's got a, a um, sort of an ethnic flair, it's French or it's, it's Japanese or um, Mexican, <clears throat> then you can find out just by going on the web kind of what the main fat sources are that those foods are cooked with. But ultimately when it's on the plate and you want to enjoy it, <clears throat> we use something called the plate method. So the plate method says, here's your plate in front of you, it's a big circle, or could be fancy, you know, be a square. And you figure that half of the space on your plate is filled with any variety of vegetables that you like. They could be cooked, they could be raw, but half the space vegetables. Let's say the vegetables are cooked in um, olive oil or cooked in, in um, an oil with a little sesame yes. flavoring. That's okay, because how much oil would a vegetable hold on to? Yeah. I mean, sure, you can go crazy, but if half of your plate is vegetables, that's the goal. And then a quarter of the space would be filled with your starchy foods, such as rice or beans or, or pasta, couscous, things like that. <clears throat> and then a quarter of the space on the plate is filled with your protein. Okay, so if you're having a blended meal, you're just going to kind of wing it and say, yeah. okay, it's about a quarter protein, meaning your chicken or lamb or beef or fish, yeah. a quarter your starch and a half veggies. Yeah. Okay, that's a great guide. So, um, what about exercise? Do you, is exercise suggested for um, an individual with that? With Absolutely. Um, more and more research every day demonstrates that whenever you use your large muscles, and so arms and legs, in any fashion, as long as it's, they're in use, so if it's walking or it could be cycling, anything, 
you improve how well your body is using the insulin that you burn. Whenever your body is using the large muscles in some way, rhythmic way, like mm -hmm. walking or cycling, you improve your body's natural insulin use. Body, the insulin is used much more effectively when there's exercise or activity in the day. Of course, it also helps with weight management. So I've kind of left weight management or calorie management for last because that's another really tough nut to crack. But to the extent possible, using the plate method to make portions a little smaller, <clears throat> trying to um, manage not to have more than three meals a day or not too many, many meals in between as a way of getting calories to sort of rein in. So if you can lose a little bit of weight, once again, it improves insulin sensitivity in the body. It lets the insulin that is there work better. That leads to better blood sugar patterns. That ultimately will lead to reducing the risk for the complications that can occur 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Okay. Well, thank you so much for giving me a great overview of, of lifestyle managements for an individual with diabetes. I'm glad you're asking. Thank you. <laughs>